It's so long ago, I can't remember, but what I do remember is buying the shoes, you have to buy the special point shoes, and we bought them in the co-op shoe shop, which used to be, strangely enough, down the stairs in this building. So my mother went in and said she wanted to order these shoes because they wouldn't keep them in stock. And the shoes arrived, they were white, Ballet shoes nowadays are all pink. They're starting to look at brown ones for people with darker skin. But mine were white and I took them to my dance class for the first time and the teacher broke them deliberately. You have to break point shoes because they're made very stiff but your foot needs to curve at the instep and she broke them off the edge of the table <laughs> and I was horrified but after that when I outgrew those shoes and got a new pair I knew that my teacher would always break them for me to make them more comfortable. I remember the first time I doing a pirouette that felt really good that felt like being the dancer in a music box spinning round on my toe um, uh, and I remember concerts that I was in and costumes that I had, but I can't say I remember being on my points for the first time because I was probably only about nine. Dan Muncy's Horse. Bring Hector Doon for the mid of Johnny, I report the morn to the barracks of air. As young Dan Muncy gathered his gear, his mother was fretting and saying a prayer. For clouds of war were gathering fast that August weekend of 1914. Telegrams buzzing and troop trains filling, and Dan the yeoman was gallus and keen. But weary Hector watched them coming. Wee Bessie hoddin' her feathers hawn. Johnny the Miner walked with a limp. But I was howkin' coal afore dawn. A poke o' oats brocht Hector running. Johnny soothing his mane and lugs and slippin' the harness over his head. A man with a knack for cuddies and dugs. For Hector Kent that Johnny was gentle and fondly licked wee Bessie's fingers, her sugar lumps an extra treat, sniffing the pooches of his gift bringers. Then Bessie was sat on the stallion's back as if a diminutive Boadicea clutching the reins of her royal steed and carried him like the Queen of Judea. But her great four legged prince had steeple chases and races won, a mighty warrior with thunder and hoofs, his tawny coat glistening in the sun. At the ford, they rested in the shade, the burn just trickling o'er the stains. Beasts and humans, truthy and sturdy, for that was a summer short o' rains. A heat haze 
hung upon the breeze, with fires swirling through the moor, the fields as brun as withered rashes, the crops all shriveled, short and poor. Afore they reached the Munsey's house, her father lifted Bessie down, saw Dan polishing his saddle and bits, laughing with his best pals of the tun. Then sitting in Hector, Dan seemed heroic. We cavalry like him, the Huns would run. That was the thought on everybody's lips. Hey, my four Christmas, <laughs> the war I done. We Bessie thought he looked so bra. But young Dan never made it to him. Blown to bits, and so is Hector. Daniel's name's on the memorial stain. Hi folks, my name's Julie Wales and I want to tell you about a place in Coburnley called Park End. Now, 50 years ago, if you'd walked up to the end of Dean Road and turned left, you'd have been standing in Park End. On the left-hand side, there was a row of wash houses, then it was a tenement, and then it was a drying greens. And I think it was about June 1968 that my mum and dad bought a flat in Park End. They lived there from 1968 to 1971. And I can picture this flat very, very clearly. When you went in the door off the close, there was a long L-shaped sort of hall. There was two doors to the left-hand side. These were two bedrooms. And in the right-hand side, there was a big living room with a wee kitchen off of that. Do you know, it was a big flat. It had lots and lots of potential. Um, and my mum and dad had lots and lots of plans for it. That was right up until the letter came in. And basically the letter said the building was to be demolished and the council would rehouse them. And that was that. I reckon my mum and dad must have been devastated, must have been gutted. Uh, I was a child. I didn't know much about what was happening at the time. My whole life evolved around going out to play. Uh, coming in, uh, having my dinner and just playing at Park End and there was loads and loads of places to play at Park End. But the first thing I did when I went out to play was make loads of noise going down the close because when I made loads of noise, Mr Wallace on the ground floor, he would hear me and he would come out to his door and he would give me a sweetie. Now, I'm not talking barley sugars, and I'm not talking mint humbugs, I'm talking Russian caramels, and these were brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So I'm chewing my sweetie, and I'm walking out the close, and the row of wash houses is just in front of me. And I'm not allowed to play in these wash houses, there's rats. Played in the wash houses hundreds of times, never once seen a rat. I have written some notes down for today, I just a uh, resume. Uh, Bass is a Gaelic word for the birch tree. Is it a coincidence that Bass became the furniture making town that it was? I was born in a house at 46 Eglinton Street, Bass, which is adjoining the Eglinton Inn as it is today, midway through the Second World War. Some of my earliest memories are of my two older sisters chalking the pavement outside the house and playing peaver using an old shoe polish tin. The other great memory is seeing all the workers heading home from the various cabinet works that were in Beath after the war. Before the war there were eight cabinet works, cabinet making being the main in industry in the town and at this time However, before the war, there were eight cabinet works. Robert Balifer, later known from 1962 as Beathcraft, and the last factory to close 
in the early 1980s. Matthew Pollock, who one may say was the father of the furniture industry in Beath, his brother John Pollock, they had originally at one factory and the two brothers sadly fell out. So they both had a factory latterly. Jai Jai Gardner, Stevenson and Higgins, Gillespie and Gillespie, Wilson and Galt, and McNeil Brothers. And I'm sitting here in the Rye Library this afternoon, or on Thursday afternoon, reading this, and I'm looking across at St. Margaret's Church. St. Margaret's Church, pulpit, communion table, communion chairs, font, and lectern were made by McNeil Brothers and Beath. A great example of Beath craftsmanship. McNeil Brothers did commence business in the Rye before moving to the old rope works in Beath. The question I often ask is why did Beath become the centre of the furniture industry in Scotland? How do you feel about have we lost the knowledge to do that? I think, to be honest, I. I, I think that's correct. You, you, I think it's, it's the same with any end of farming. Fellas are born farmers because they're in a farm and they learn for their predecessors and so on and so forth. The shipbuilding industry was like that. These people worked in that type of environment and the miners did, they worked in their own environment, which is a horrible environment they work in. But again, these people lived in and breathed these industries. And the steel industry, similarly, <coughs> similarly was, was, was an industry like that. And I think, I'm not saying you can't train folk to, to make steel, you what you can. Yes, you can train people to do whatever. But there's a there's a kind of innate thing in people that live in, in communities like what Glen Garnet was, or Cobble, places like that. And folk have a a local skill which is it's kind of born in them, if you know what I mean. See, going into the steel, as I said to you, when I went in the steelwork, I had never, never worked or intended to work in the steelwork. But within a very short time, I ended up with an awful lot of responsibility for things that, I mean, I don't know how long it would take to train folk to do these things, but I had heard things, if I was that height, that I knew, but I didn't know I knew. And that's, I think, maybe, that may be the part of the question you're asking. Can you get it back? I think you can get it back. I think it took a long, a long while to get it to the stage that it was where people lived it on a daily basis. And I mean, I, 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 have, I hear guys talking in the tune yet, and it's clear they know things that, and how things worked that you wouldn't have believed because they never had the education to understand their processes, but they didn't. And I think that's, you, 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 you get that, I think it's in a community and irrespective of what the type of industry is. I believe without community and community involvement, the whole of UK, the whole of anywhere could not operate. So it's, it's extremely important to try and get community, more community involvement by more people and if it weren't for community running groups and sessions like knitting clubs, like beggars, like guides, brownies, scouts, people would lose contact. And unfortunately in these days, because of influx of people, I would suggest that, that um, an awful lot of the, what I would call old tenement community where everybody in a stair knew everybody in their stair and the two adjacent stairs. In modern housing estates and in council estates, because of the movement of people, that community is lacking. And this is why with the, the uh, letter pick when I was organising it, rather than just us as a um, 
neighborhood watch group get three or four or half a dozen people together to involve the, the canoe club, bar mill, gate side, everybody. And in the evening have a, a social event rather than just have a, a quick litter pick, make it social, get people together, get people to appreciate how much, how, how valuable community is. Because if you don't have community, you've got nothing. I'm going to start now. One afternoon I took a walk from Bees down to the den. Twas there I spent some happy days, but it's many years since then. The place is mostly deserted now. There's just a house or twa. The office and the store are gone, and they haven't left a miner's roar. I dug up the road a bit and stood and looked around. I couldn't see a soul about, nor could I hear a sound. And oh, the den is very sadly changed from the, from the den that I had seen. When the pits were going, we had a senior football team. The house that Jack built is standing yet, but now it's the co. The wee shop that Alan kept is gone long, long ago. The big lawn's gone and the cobbler's shop and Granny Walker's work and the wee school row is gone and all that stood beside the kirk. The old house is standing yet. We kent it best by pugs. But there's no a buddy running now with bottles or with jugs. For now it's lost its license, and there's no a drop to drink, but many a bottle has been sold from the wee hole in the wall. Up on the knoll, I, at last I climbed and stood and looked around. On the meadow head, the mall side, and the dear old bowling green. And I turned round the other way and see the same old school, but there's no wains going to it now, and oh, the place is still. When we were canons at the school, when we got our holidays, we ran across the heather moss, or up, up on Rubby's braes. And in the, bumbo, in the bumbo we took a, dro a duke, or up some bing would climb, then hungry would hurry home, and down the culrill run. The happy days have long since gone, we're no so young you can, when past our sixtieth milestone, we're nearing journey's end. And now I am feeling kind of stiff, but I was supple then, when I played football in the alley, with the canons of the den. Well, the old folk I remember, like the houses now all gone, with their weird and wondrous nicknames, still their memories linger on. There was Stolty Bell and Fish Kate, Daddlety and Lum, the cobbler, the butcher, the sailor, and Pug Young. There was Tam the Warmer Cuckoo, Pluffy Deans and Tam the Baker, and Uri and Bummer, now all gone to their maker. And as I stand at the corner, as I do now and then, Makes me very proud to say I was born in the den. I'd like to talk about a place in Bar Mill that's known as the Deed Man's Planting. And this is a 18th century cholera pit. It's in a little plantation, a planting in Scottish, um, just over by Bar Mill Park. The deed man's planting was something that you heard when you were a wee boy and people just said, oh, you know, there's a place where the, the, there's a burial ground and you were just to keep away from it. And I've been asking a lot of elderly folk now in their 80s or 90s that grew up in the 1930s and they basically said the same. People just said that, that was kind of sacred ground and stay away from it. So they knew there was a kind of ghostly supernatural type of feeling about the place, they, they would either not go to it at all, or if they were near it, they would run past it fast, because they knew there was something not quite normal about this place, but they didn't know the full story. Nobody, nobody knew, nobody was old enough to know all the details, and that's one of the reasons that I took upon myself to try and study this as part of my Bar Mill history studies was to find out as much as I could about the truth of the deed man's planting. So in the literature, the, there's, there's a book called Rambles Round Beeth that was published in 1925 by a guy called Sam Porterfield. And he talks about the deed man's planting and he mentions the story that people were buried there. 40 people had died of cholera and were buried there. And the story was that a group of boys from the village had went up on the hill where there was a gypsy camp 
and they'd went up there to get their fortunes told. And after that, they'd brought the cholera, they'd caught the cholera from the gypsies and brought it into the village. So that, that was the old story. But he notes as well in 1925 that there was nobody old enough to remember firsthand that, if whether that was true or not. I've, I've looked into that and, you know, there's, n there's no evidence whatsoever for any of these things other than that there was a cholera epidemic in 1834 in Beath and 208 people um, were infected and about 100 of them, about half of them actually died of it. I've been involved with the Barmel Conservation Group for over 10 years now um, since it started and one, one of the projects that I suggested was to restore the Deedman's plant and, and this was um, inspired by an old friend of mine, Robert Boyd from Drumbuie House, and he was a church elder and a local historian, and he had always wanted the site to be recognised officially and to have the minister from the church up to bless it. So we were able to do that. Sadly, um, both Robert and his wife had passed away by then, but his son and his daughter were part of the ceremony that, that we held in October 2014 to put a memorial bench in and also a memorial stone cairn with a plaque with a, a note um, remembering the 40 or so people that were buried there.